Hi guys, welcome back. Uh, we shall now be talking about blood components. So let us first see how are they generated. And as you can see in the image, there are satellite bags attached to the main bag containing whole blood from which we can generate the blood components. So WB stands for whole blood. In blood banks, what they do is they would be subjecting the whole blood to a high speed centrifugation. Alphabet C would stand for centrifugation. And this would help you in generating packed RBCs that will increase the hematocrit of the person. Then plasma, which will be frozen and would be called as fresh frozen plasma. It can be stored at minus 30 for as long as for one year. And uh, thirdly, we will be having a buffy coat, which will be having white blood cells. And along this would be present platelets. Now this unit, which is having the buffy coat with the platelets would be subjected to a low speed centrifugation. And this will help in generating platelets for you. These platelets will then be pooled. So we are talking about random donor platelets in this particular case. This is one method of generating blood components. Let us study another method which will also be producing blood components but in a different way. WB stands for whole blood. This will be initially subjected to a low speed centrifugation. Please note in the earlier technique, we were subjecting the sample to a high speed centrifugation. This time it's a low speed spin. This will break down the blood components into two. That is one is packed RBC and second would be platelet rich plasma, which would be written as PRP. The unit that is having PRP is now subjected to what is called as a high speed spin. You can remember any of the two, it's just two methods by which we are generating the blood components and now the PRP component that is the platelet rich plasma component will be used to generate one RDP that is random donor platelets uh, along with this would be generated fresh frozen plasma. In both the techniques the fresh frozen plasma that is generated can then be thawed and is used to generate cryoprecipitate. Our objective is to understand how are these components generated that is two methods that I've explained to you initially high speed followed by low speed or low speed followed by high speed spin and you can generate these blood components and then subsequently we will study regarding where are these components used. So let us start with packed RBCs. The storage temperature would be 4 degrees Celsius. The shelf life would be ranging from 35 to 42 days. This range will depend upon which anticoagulant and additive solution was used. So if the additive solution used is CDPA, that is citrate, phosphodextrozygar, shelf life is 35 days. If it is sagam, that is saline, adenine, glucose and mannitol, then the shelf life would be 42 days. So when it comes to the aspect of whole blood, then one unit of whole blood would be having a volume of 450 ml. The storage temperature will be 4 degrees Celsius. The shelf life will range between 35 to 42 days. This will depend upon the additive solution which has been used for preservation of blood. Most of the time in government hospitals we use CPDA. So therefore citrate, phosphate, dextrose, adenine that would be 35 days and sagam is saline, adenine, glucose and mannitol that would be 42 days. The importance of whole blood has gradually reduced nowadays because we are using blood components. So the main use of whole blood is mainly volume replacement in patients having acute hemorrhagic shock. This is a patient of bleeding esophageal varices, peptic ulcer disease, gunshot injury. In acute hemorrhagic shock, if a person has been losing a substantial amount of blood that is more than 25% of the total circulating fluid volume depletion is occurring in the patient. Then the oxygen levels or the oxygen carrying capacity in the body will be so significantly affected that there would be not only substantial hypoxia but metabolic acidosis. That metabolic acidosis will cause less ability of the blood to clot. Plus when blood is lost from the body the heat component is also lost. So hypothermia will also result in less clotting ability. So most of the time you will see that hemorrhagic shock 
Wesson's hemorrhagic shock. Why? Because they said the metabolic acidosis component and the hypothermia component that, that develops due to substantial blood loss from the body results in less ability of the blood to clot. The important trigger I would put it as hypothermia and acidosis combined inhibiting the ability of the blood to clot and therefore the bleeding part continues to worsen in the patient. So nowadays when are you giving whole blood? You are giving it in case there is a substantial depletion of the circulating fluid volume but there are problems when you store blood in a patient. If you are giving fresh blood great but if you are storing blood then with storage there are some problems which are to be remembered. One of the primary problems would be that uh, the platelet count will begin to reduce gradually because obviously platelets, the longevity of them is limited as we will discuss. Second problem would be that the levels of 2,3 biphosphoglycerate, 2,3 BPG will fall. This will increase the oxygen affinity of the RBCs towards oxygen. What I mean by increase of oxygen affinity is that RBCs will become selfish and they will keep the oxygen with themselves. They will not give it to the tissues. You see, I want the red blood cells to be in a donation mode. I want them to carry oxygen and I want, it, want them to give it to the tissues. If they keep it with themselves, then the basic purpose is not satisfied. No, if you are giving near expiry date blood, the problem is that the RBCs will keep all the oxygen with themselves. They are not going to give it to the tissues. So, the purpose is not solved. Whereas in fresh blood, because the values of 2-3 BP just substantially high the RBC's oxygen affinity is lesser that means they don't want to keep oxygen with themselves they want to donate it to tissues and that is advantageous to the patient so as the blood shelf life increases as you close come towards towards the expiry period of the blood the oxygen affinity increases and therefore delivery to tissues will be substantially reduced uh, do remember the statement affinity and delivery they are inversely related if affinity is more delivery is lesser vice versa then the levels of heat labile factors will also reduce that is factor 5 and factor 8. So if a person is having a bleeding diathesis, you see whole blood alone is not sufficient. We might have to give uh, fresh frozen plasma which is one of the richest source of clotting factors to the patient because stored blood does not have factor 5 and factor 8. So these are the limitations with respect to whole blood that is why nowadays we are preferring packed RBCs for our patients and the rise of hematocrit with packed RBCs and whole blood is identical because after all whole blood all components are not required so remaining components are actually going waste so that is why nowadays we are recommending giving packed red blood cells to our patients. So if they ask you that one unit of packed RBC will increase the hemoglobin of a person by how much amount then it is 1 gram percent. Or he might say hematocrit will increase by how much percentage so the answer would be 3%. So when it comes to packed RBCs in a patient, the shelf life will be same as that of whole blood that is 35 to 42 days and the storage temperature is also same that is 4 degrees Celsius. Packed RBCs will raise the hemoglobin of the person by approximately 1 gram percent. So I am giving 2 units of packed RBCs, it will avoid the volume overloading. Like in thalassemia major patient, I don't need whole blood. In thalassemia major patient, I need to give packed RBCs to the patient on a recurrent basis. So I will be able to upgrade the hemoglobin by 1 gram percent or the hematocrit which is also called as fat cell volume will upgrade by 3%. The main advantage of packed RBCs over whole blood is that you will avoid the volume overloading component. If he says what is the optimal target hemoglobin to be achieved in a person in whom you have given packed RBCs, then values between 7 to 8 are okay because they will reduce or prevent critical ischemia which can cause myocardial infarction, subendocardial ischemia in a patient. He says this much of optimal level can be obtained. Like if he says a blood cancer patient is having severe anemia because the person had excessive bleeding, AML patient had excessive bleeding. So what will be the optical opt, optimal target hemoglobin that you would like to achieve? So 7 to 8 gram percent is okay because at least it will prevent critical ischemia that will affect the brain or the heart of the patient. Another important component to be remembered then is platelets. Coming to the next component that is the platelets, there are two methods of generating them. One would be the pooled method that is pooled platelets from multiple donors with the same blood group or another method can be to use this technique of apheresis. Here you will remove blood from the body of the patient, the machine will return back the red blood cells and the plasma and the uh, white blood cells back into the body of the patient but the platelets would obviously remain behind so there are two ways one is pooled platelets and second is single donor apheresis platelets 
the bag which is having food platelets the volume is about 50 to 70 ml and the single donor afrsis platelet the volume of the bag is about 200 to 400 ml that will give you an impression that the single donor afrsis platelet might be having the bag might be having more amount of platelets well that is not the case the single donor afrsis platelet might be having some components of the plasma so the bag volume is bigger but that does not mean that the rise in the mean level of the platelets that will occur in the body of the patient will be higher for both of them harrison states that the re rise of the mean platelet level in the blood would be between 5000 to 10000 platelets per cubic millimeter only do remember the fact that less than how much can you have spontaneous intracranial bleeding then it is 5000 remember our platelet count is 1.5 to 4.5 lakhs if the platelet count is less than 5000 that is when the chances of spontaneous intracranial bleed is present in a patient listen to my next statement carefully if no fever is present in a patient so that means this cutoff that i'm teaching you is not valid for dengue hemorrhagic fever okay if there is no fever if there is no evidence of any infection in the patient the word is no fever no infection in the patient then the threshold of the value of platelet which is important to prevent any kind of bleed and what i mean by bleed here is obviously a life-threatening bleed that is the intracranial bleed then the threshold is 5000 but what will you answer if in the question there is no mention of whether there is fever or coagulopathy or any infection in the body he just says threshold for platelet transfusion in a patient to prevent any kind of spontaneous ic bleeding what will be the platelet count minimum required for the patient that the answer should be given as equal to or less than 10000 platelets per cubic millimeter I repeat my statement once again if he mentions the word fever the threshold becomes higher if the fever word is not given it is 5000 if nothing is given answer it as 10000 the shelf life of platelets would be approximately five days and they are stored at room temperature at 20 to 24 degrees celsius in a state of constant agitation and once they're released from the blood bank they should be transfused as early as possible do remember the fact that when it comes to platelets the chances of infection will be higher why because of the fact that uh, they will be uh, stored at room temperature so contamination chances are relatively lesser in contrast with fresh frozen plasma because fresh frozen plasma does not contain cellular components so chances of infection are significantly minimized and uh, also the fact that fresh frozen plasma will not never be able to transfer cytomegalovirus because cytomegalovirus goes via the white blood cells and fresh frozen plasma because it is stored that long it will not be having any viable white blood cells so the transmission of cytomegalovirus is never possible with especially fresh frozen plasma which has been stored for a substantially long duration the volume of bag that would be having fresh frozen plasma will be in the range of 200 to 250 ml storage temperature i have already emphasized before you and i'll say it again it can be stored at minus 30 degrees celsius and can be stored for as long as one year fresh frozen plasma is the richest source of clotting factors it will increase the coagulation factor level in the body and therefore it is preferred for any condition where a coagulopathy is present in a patient the coagulofactor coagulation factors will increase by two percentage points whenever fresh frozen plasma is given and what will it provide it will provide the basic necessary components important for clotting that is mainly fibrinogen so that explains the importance of this in dic it will also establish a balance because it will also provide protein c protein s antithrombin 3 and over and above this it will also provide albumin which explains why sometimes we might use it in patients of burns after 24 hours we do not use uh, fresh frozen plasma in burns in first 24 hours we give fluids that is crystallites and after 24 hours fresh frozen plasma can be given to the patient what are the uses of fresh frozen plasma well one important would be a uh, reversal of coagulopathy with respect to warfarin toxicity i would like to highlight the fact that uh, uh, with warfarin if provided in the mcq is prothrombin complex concentrate pcc i'll just mention the name here though i've done that even in uh, cardiac component whenever he says warfarin toxicity with life-threatening bleeding like ic bleeding in a patient and he says inr is 20 normal inr should be like you know you can increase it to two times three times maybe 3.5 times prothrombin complex concentrate is always to be given when a patient of warfarin toxicity 
is having a international normalized ratio which is in double digits like maybe 20 and you can just bleed any time or the bleeding part has started so first answer is prothrombin complex concentrate if this is not in the options then it is fresh frozen plasma and do not answer vitamin k with respect to any life-threatening bleed associated with this the second important use of fresh frozen plasma is with respect to coagulopathy that is disseminated intravascular coagulation and then is the role in thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura in ttp which is a separate discussion that i have taken in the kidney section you can listen to the treatment part which is plasma pharesis so uh, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura we do plasma pharesis even in guillain barre syndrome we might do plasma pharesis and even in myasthenic crisis we do plasma pharesis so that's another usage of fresh frozen plasma the last component that we need to remember here is cryoprecipitate which is produced by fresh frozen plasma. By thawing fresh frozen plasma we can produce cryo. The components of cryoprecipitate will be factor 8, fibrinogen, von Willebrand factor. The MCQ will say that it does not contain which clotting factor and that would be answered by US factor 9. Therefore, Cryoprecipitate will not be useful for management of, your answer would be Christmas disease which is also called as Haemophilia B. The main advantage of cryoprecipitate is that it is providing you fibrinogen, the values of fibrinogen will increase by approximately 0.3 to 1 gram per unit of cryoprecipitate that is given to the patient which explains the fact that why we can use it in persons with cardiopathies. One of the important uses of cryoprecipitate to be remembered from MCQ perspective would be useful for management of even von Willebrand disease type 2. Type 2 von Willebrand disease is characterized by dysfunctional von Willebrand factor whereas type 3 is characterized by absence of von Willebrand factor. This is dysfunctional for type 2, absent for type 3. So both would be benefited by giving cryoprecipitate if there is a continuous bleeding occurring in a patient after any surgical intervention that was done. The third important usage which is to be remembered is it can also be used as topical glue that looks a little surprising but topical glue that will help in achieving hemostasis. So I explained to you aspects of uses of various blood components which are important like packed RBCs. Obviously whole blood would be used for volume replacement if the person is having bleeding. Fresh frozen plasma and then about cryoprecipitate and platelets primarily. Out of all of these, I would especially like you to listen to the platelets part very carefully because most of the time in the exam, they like to ask about the usage for platelets in a patient. If a person is having life-threatening bleeding, the first thing to be given is packed RBCs. I repeat my statement. If a person is having life-threatening bleeding, first thing to be given is packed RBCs. Why? Because they will control the metabolic acidosis component, hypoxic component and the hypothermia component obviously because we will use the inline warmer and we will ensure that the hemoglobin values are normalized in a patient first because oxygen is a primary importance. You deliver oxygen and the rest of the things will start falling back to normal. So if a question begins by saying bleeding patient, don't straight away answer platelet. You see, Dengue, hemorrhagic fever, bleeding, I understand platelets are to be given, but in a chap who is having life-threatening bleeding like esophageal varice, peptic ulcer, our first objective is to stabilize the hemoglobin values in the patient by either giving whole blood, which is rarely available nowadays considering the fact that the blood bank will use up the component specifically for specific users. So this is a short lecture regarding the uses of various components that I have explained to you and keep working and uh, thank you so much for listening.